The next thing we're going to do is we want to be able to take some impressions of Mr. Bothy um, and start the process of making his new denture. Why don't we uh, get you to take your teeth back out again? Mm -hmm. I got it going. Yeah, you got it. Kathy will take them for you. And we want to go through the process of making some alginate impressions. Now, there's something I want you to remember about your alginate impression techniques. The model that we are going to generate from our alginate impression is the model that our approved provisional denture is going to be made on. So this procedure has to be accurate, and it's very critical that we get good soft tissue coverage. And in this process, we want to overextend our impression. I know that sounds kind of weird, but we want to overextend it so that we displace as much tissue as we can. One of the things that uh, Kathy and I have found over the years is the AccuDent or the AccuGel uh, impression procedure for denture patients and partial patients is just excellent. And I didn't use it for many years. I held off using it, thinking, oh, I'm good enough to just use gel tray. I just use the trays I've always used, you know. Change is hard. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but I finally got convinced. My friend Tom McDonald convinced me to try it. And it really gives a much better impression. Kathy's got it all laid out over here. We use an alginator, which is an automatic mixer. The AccuGel system comes with an injectable or a light body and then a tray material, a heavy body, and we use a thermometer because it recommends that the material be between 80 and 85 degrees, the water, when you're mixing it. I will tell you this, I didn't believe that at first, but you really need to use your thermometer to get the temperature of your water right, or your mix doesn't do well. We always use a timer because how long does it take this to set? three minutes. Now one of the things I would recommend that you do if you're a dental assistant or a lab assistant, read the directions and know how long it takes something to set. That's a critical factor in knowing all of your dental materials. So the AccuGel or the AccuDent system, there's one for edentulous patients, no teeth, and then there's one for patients that are partially edentulous that you're going to make partials and stuff. It also comes with a whole series of trays that you can select the tray that you want. This is the edentulous trays. comes in a little box. And the trays are perforated. And one of the things we do is we use the patient's existing denture to select the tray. Which, if the denture fits in their mouth at all, then it's going to be pretty close to, to what we can use. And so, we've pre-selected a tray for Mr. Bothy, and as you can see, his upper denture is going to fit in there just like that. So that tray is going to work pretty good, and we want it overextended. And then his lower denture is going to fit in that tray. It's about the same size. We're going to pick up a little more on the distal or the retromolar pad area. You can also sit it on there like that and realize that it's about the same size. Knowing that we've got a fairly accurate tray size, now what I'm going to ask Kathy to do is to put some rope wax or some utility wax all the way around the trays. Then I'll try my tray in Mr. Bothy's mouth. This is a four-handed procedure because you have to mix two uh, different bodies of impression material and then you have to uh, be loading a tray and loading a syringe and everything. Okay. This is the lower. This is the lower first. I'm going to try the lower end. And as you can see, I've got right wax all the way around. I'm just going to roll it in there. And if you lift your tongue up, perfect. Kind of stick it right at me and relax it. Very good. I can then take a look to see how much room I've got if I've gone too far down his throat. Gosh, it almost sits in there without me holding it. Got a little suction even. Okay, so we feel pretty good about that. 
Then I'm going to try the upper end. Kathy's put some rope wax around the upper. Create a little post dam. Now what I'm going to have you do, Mr. Bothy, is let your lower jaw relax and close a little bit. Perfect. One of the reasons you can't get a big enough tray in some patients' mouths is that you run into the coronary process of the mandible. So if you get them to close a little bit, the tray will be able to go back into that area and the mandible gets out of the way. So I can assess the fit of that. I know my head's in your way, Dennis. And so I feel pretty good about that. The other thing Kathy's going to do, and I don't think they recommend this, but we do it anyway, is we're going to put adhesive on these trays. The adhesive that we use is alginate adhesive, and it's made by the Gets Hold company. Uh, oh, and it, uh, Gets Hold, yeah. <laughs> no pun intended, huh? <laughs> um, I usually like to start with the lower impression. Um, get that one kind of out of the way. It's the hardest one to do. And uh, what I'd like for you to do, and particularly, Dennis, as you're filming this, I want you to get a close eye about how Kathy and I are going to work to do this. Uh, it's a very coordinated thing, and uh, there's a couple of key factors that I want you to get out of this. You see this mirror in my left hand? Part of the problem with getting an impression tray in a patient's mouth is dentists and assistants will use their finger and try and get the tray in. Well, you take up all the room in the patient's mouth with your finger and you can't get the tray in because the hole's not big enough. So if you always keep a mirror right there or right here, when I do the lower, I put it on their right shoulder. When I do the upper, I put it on the left shoulder and you'll see why. So that when I go to put that tray in, I can put the mirror in and now I have plenty of room you saw me do it when I tried my tray in. So this is one of the keys to good alginate impressions. Is that right there? <laughs> we resisted for years using the alginator. Because the first time I ever used it, I shot alginate all over the walls. Now she's mixed the injectable material. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go under the tongue with the injectable material all the way around. And then I'm going to go out into the buccal vestibule with the remainder. So I'm going to have a thin wash of a light body material sitting right over the ridge and into the retromalohyoid fossa. Now the tray material I have found is a much stiffer, a much firmer material and it's going to act to displace the injectable material. Now that's a big tray so I'm going to kind of slide it in. Very good. You see how my mirror helped me? I'm going to get you to lift your tongue up. We know the tray fits because we already tried it in. And then I'm going to just hold my fingers over the little landing pads and muscle trim, I think is the term they used to use in dental school, and pull that impression material up into the fornix of the vestibule. Stick your tongue out one more time and relax. Okay. The other thing I want you to notice is my hand position and the fact that I'm relaxed. My elbows are down, my shoulders are relaxed, and I can transmit that relaxed feel right into the patient, mm -hmm. really. Uh, this is a very anxiety-provoking procedure for patients, but uh, you know, I, I ask participants to take our other courses all the time. How do you know when the alginate is set? And most everybody tells me, oh, well, I stick my thumbnail in it. Well, the message you're telling the patient is you don't really know how long it's going to take for that stuff to set. When you set a timer and it's tick-tocking back there and you say it's got one more minute, in a very subtle way, you're telling that patient, we know our stuff. We know our materials. And when that dings, it's going to be ready. 
That's right. And that's called added value, by the way. As we get into about a 30-second time, I start to loosen the, the cheeks up just a little bit. You can move your tongue just a little bit if you like. That's going to kind of break a seal for us. Okay, me win. Okay. I can slide this impression out. What I want you to notice about this impression is we really overextended into the retromylohyoid fossa area, out onto the buccal shelf. We got a great impression of his ridge. You can actually start to see the S curve that's going to be formed in the border of his final denture. Even though I'm the one that took this one, I think this would pass at the prosthetic department at school for a pretty good preliminary denture impression. What we'll do now is we'll take this impression, we'll wrap it in a wet paper towel, and we'll put it in a humidor. And that humidor is called a Ziploc bag. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that can be stored, and we want to pour this impression as quickly as we possibly can but it'll probably be 45 minutes to an hour before we'll do that. So we put it in a Ziploc bag. It'll stay nice and fresh. And so what Kathy's going to do, she's going to set us up to uh, take the upper. It'll be same song, second verse. Um, I don't really know. I can't give you a, a, a reason why I take the lower first. But I think in the back of my mind, most patients are a little nervous about gagging, to be honest with you. And if you can take that lower and let them bring their tongue up, they don't typically gag on the lower. And so you can demonstrate that, you, that you're going to do a good job. The upper seems to be a little less anxiety provoking at that point. Now when I do the upper, I pull around behind the patient. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to inject into the vestibule all the way around using my mirror to retract. And then with about a third of that syringe material left, I'll just put it in the palate because I don't want to get a big old bubble in the palate. When we first started doing this, I, I didn't like the whole lag time between the injectable and the tray material. But what I've noticed now is it just makes it a little easier. It makes it a little smoother. You can see how that that mirror is helping me. There you go. Perfect, Mr. Bowden. What I'm going to do is use the handle of the depression tray as a guide for my midline. And I'm going to push up in the back. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to get a comfort position. I'm going to relax my elbows. And I'm going to cradle Jim's head and just kind of let that energy flow that way. Now we're going to remove this. Sometimes this upper impression is hard to get out. You did great. Mm, you did great. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Once again, uh, Dennis, I'm going to try and hold this up so you can see down into that impression. Sometimes the, the depth is hard to do. It almost looks like it's inverted. Um, what I want you to notice is we got a great impression here back around the tuberosities. We can actually see all the rugae. The vestibule is really good. And what I want you to also take a look at is the tray material almost gave us a selective pressure impression. The tray material came through in those areas where I did not inject the injectable. And the injectable has given us an impression of the borders. We really don't have a lot of bubbles or anything. And using the tray as a as a centering of the handle of the tray as a centering device, we pretty much got it in the center. Okay, we're going to do the same thing, wrap it in a wet paper towel. We have a full lab in our office, a uh, wet lab, um, and so Kathy serves as our lab assistant, and my son Jimmy um, helps out in the lab too. We'll create a pan with Mr. Bothy's name and the date he was in, and we have a routing slip in the office that tells us where that's going to go and what it needs to be done and when Mr. Bothy's next appointment is. Because what I'd like for you to let me do is process all this information. Um, we'll look at the films, the forms we filled out, we'll get our models poured. Because here's the deal. With a new patient that's a denture patient, 
I can't go any farther. I can't take a face boat and I can't take a bite record. How are you going to do it? So the new patient exam for a denture patient, two appointments, ladies and gentlemen. One was to do our clinical exam, assess the existing denture. The second appointment is going to be somehow get the stone cast we make on an articulator so that we can see the maxillomandibular relationship, the jaw relation. I'm going to tell you something. If you tell Mr. Both you can make him a denture, you get three quarters of the way through and realize his tuberosities are hanging down in the back and you've got no room to put any teeth. Now you tell him he has to have tuberosity reductions, you ain't looking too good. You'd rather be a prophet than make excuses. And so I'm not going to promise Mr. Bothy anything until I can see those models on our articulator and his jaw relation records. So here's what we'll do. I'm going to give you your old dentures back, but I want you to do me a favor. I want you to try and find some pictures of you when you had teeth. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's an interesting thing because many people can't. And it's okay. If you can't find any pictures, it's okay. But if you can get a patient to bring some, even a high school annual picture, your teeth when they came in were meant to last you your whole life. They're not going to change that much. And so when I start selecting teeth and start setting some teeth, if I have a record of what your real teeth look like, it will help us through the process. If you can't find them, though, we'll use phonetics and we'll use some other things. The key there is it'll also show you the maxillomandibular relationship a lot of times. Um, I've made dentures for patients that we thought were class three. They ended up being class one, class two. You look back at their high school annual picture, and they were class two. By the same token, we had a young man that we were making uh, partial and a denture for, and his jaw relation was really a class three. We look back at a picture from early in his college days, and he was a true skeletal class three. You could see it in the, in the photograph. So there's a lot of things you can glean from a photograph, even if you were only 20 years old in that photograph. Some people bring me wedding pictures. Some people bring me um, uh, high school annual pictures, as I said, uh, family occasions. Doesn't matter how small the picture is. Because what I do with the pictures that the patients bring me is I take my digital intraoral camera, and I photograph the picture. Then I can zoom in and just look at the mouth. And I can put it in my computer and do that. So a lot of times that really helps uh, us determine whether a patient was missing a tooth. Sometimes they'll have a crossbite. You can actually see the crossbite in their smile. Dennis has got crossbite. Look at that. Huh? And <laughs> yes, sir, you see? <laughs> <laughs> Granny and Dennis. Um, so what we're going to do between now and the next time I see you is we're going to make some little devices that will fit in your mouth that I can look at that jaw relation. They're called base plates and occlusion rims. And the next time I see you, we'll set some teeth in there. We'll actually put some teeth in the wax, see how you like them. Great. See how I like them. Great. All right.